evening. My name is Jamie Shanker Passero, Associate Director of the Temple Small Business Development Center. Today we are going to have a discussion with Adam Glads Gladsden of Broad Street Labs, who will be discussing cybersecurity issues when moving your team to remote work. Since many of our offices are closed, we've had to move to remote work. Uh, maybe some of us had plans for that, had an action plan in place to make that flawless. Other businesses may have had to do it more haphazardly. So we'll have a discussion about, um, about the cybersecurity issues that can come up when you do have remote work. Um, so thank you for joining us, Adam. We really appreciate it. Sure, my pleasure. All right, so why don't we go ahead and get started here. Some of the topics that I wanted to cover, clearly we're gonna talk about telework. I wanted to really start with the definition of, of cyber risk. Um, talking about the state of cyber risk as it relates to small, medium-sized businesses, talk about some general strategies, and then you start to develop where the impact of COVID-19 comes into play. And we'll certainly talk about that impact on telework. And I provided a little bit of a readiness checklist of things that we can look out for, things that you could do to be uh, resilient in your cyber hygiene, because there's two flavors of this. It's really on the employer side. And then there's the personal ownership of the employee working at home. So we'll get into all those various topics. Uh, real quick introduction of myself. As Jamie mentioned, my name is Adam Gladstone. I'm the founder and CEO of Broad Street Labs. I come from over 20 years in technology, working really at the intersection of tech and business. I spent the last 10 really helping companies launch new products and services with go-to-market in the cyber risk and information security space. Um, I founded Broad Street Labs last year in 2019 really the culmination of work that, that I've been doing, helping companies shift and transform their cyber risk. Uh, and really the need that kept coming up in, in time and time again was around serving uh, the small mid-sized businesses. Um, large enterprises just don't have the appetite to go after them. And in today's cyber landscape, nobody's really get, getting hit harder than small companies. And so uh, I had dealt with too many personal um, whether it's friends and family, but things close to me, people losing their businesses over relatively simple cyber attacks. And so I saw this as an opportunity to really bring my expertise uh, in-house. And so we specialize in, in educating and building cyber resilient strategies with these smaller companies. Uh, and we do this through a combination of cyber insurance brokerage and, and risk advisory services. So real quick, I wanna start with an overview of what is cyber risk? There's a lot of different definitions out there. I'm choosing to go with one that's more accepted by, by NIST, the National Institute for Standard and Technology. Uh, but before I start, and I have this quote, and it's quite appropriate here since we're dealing with Temple, but John Allen Paulos, who is a, a mathematics professor at Temple, uh, uncertainty is the only certainty there is and knowing how to live with insecurity is the only security. And I don't think that could be more appropriate in general, when you look at cyber risk, but the world that we now live in and what's, what's really occurred in the last few weeks, it's really forced this issue uh, upon everyone globally. Um, not only does uh, the coronavirus not discriminate against, uh, against its victims, really from, uh, from a cyber risk perspective, the impact is, is really the same. Um, doesn't matter if you're a small or large business, it doesn't matter what industry you're in, we're kind of all in this, and so we have to approach this in that similar vein. So when we talk about cyber risk, we're really talking about the risk of financial loss, any sort of operational disruption or any damage from the failure of digital technologies employed for informational and operational functions, um, really any sort of information system that, that, that you use that can cause any sort of financial loss. So. The question that a lot of people have is where does cyber risk fit with IT risk and operational risk? And even Gartner has taken on a new definition in the last few years that risk used to be siloed within organizations and, and they all had their own place. And technology risk set obviously with the IT folks and operational risk and corporate risk set more. It could sit with legal, it could sit with, with finance. Um, now, they've all kind of rolled into one and it's being referred to as integrated risk management. So when you talk about cyber risk, yes, it could be an element of technology risk, but really, and especially for smaller companies, you're talking about business risk because cyber risk is directly tied 
to the survival of your company, uh, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to get involved with the small and medium sized businesses. Um, I wanted to throw off some stats. These are some based off recent reports just to kind of illustrate what the small companies are up against with regard to cyber risk. Unlike large enterprises, and they get most of the press, whether it's the Equifaxes or the Targets um, of the world, they can sustain some of the major data breaches that they've had. They're very large companies. They have the, uh, the financial might, certainly the legal might, and they also have the insurance behind it to at least offset some of the costs. Smaller companies don't have that luxury. So if you look at some of these stats here, and these are taken from 2017 to 19, and this report came out in October of last year, when you look on that left-hand chart and you see the companies that have experienced a cyber attack in the last 12 months, yeah, the numbers remain kind of steady with cyber attacks, but you're talking over 60%. This is with over 2,000 respondents of companies between really zero and 250 employees. So that's a really large amount and enough to really scare anyone. When you look at data breaches, that number starts to really climb up. And that's really reflective of the changing nature of the type of attacks that you're seeing against these small businesses. And if you look to the right, that really illustrates the type of attacks we're seeing. They talk about phishing and social engineering. That also ties into ransomware. Um, so clearly, the largest component, the biggest shift, cyber attacks used to focus on, on disruption. It was about disrupting businesses and, and the, the hope or the goal of them to, to lose revenue through that disruption or maybe, maybe hurt the brand. That's really gone now away into the realization that regardless of the type of data or where that data comes from, if the data has any sort of personal information tied to it, and especially if it has credit card information, financial information, it has monetary value in a certain market. And so that's where the, the playing field has really been leveled with smaller companies when you discuss cyber attacks and you discuss cybersecurity, they used to be separate and now they're not. And smaller companies clearly don't have the means and the resources, as we'll see in this next slide here, to really be able to provide security postures without being proactive, without getting some assistance. So why are they being attacked? Insufficient personnel is number one. Smaller companies just don't have the budget or the expertise. Many as I'm sure, and it could be some of the folks participating here, either have a part-time IT staff, they might have an IT consulting company, uh, Rarely many of them have a full IT staff, and if they do, they might not have the expertise, which is fairly specialized now beyond just IT services. Um, we're all strained with budgets. Clearly, there, there's a cost component to fighting the war on cyber, although we'll kind of discuss here a little bit. There are some very cost-effective ways and simple strategies that can be used by small companies, even with small budgets and Broad Street Labs. We specialize in helping to define what those are. Um, so. The, the top two there, not having the right personnel, not having adequate budgets. And the third one's still pretty big, not understanding how to protect against cyber attack. This is the education piece that's missing. It's, it's security awareness training. It's an education about solutions. It's not a fun, it's a lack of a fundamental understanding of what cyber attacks mean, what they mean to your business, what kind of harm they can cause. And because of that, they don't get the attention that they deserve. On the top right there, there's a stat. This is a totally overused stat, and I, I, I was remiss. I had to at least throw it up there. 60%, the percentage of small businesses that go out of business after six months. Um, that's been noted, and that's really been popularized, but it really does just lend itself to the fact that the majority of small businesses, if you get hit with a substantial attack early in your business, or if you're a very small business, it's very difficult to overcome. That average cost of 1.9 million there, um, that's a disruption over 12 months. I think the number for an average attack is about $180,000. So this is kind of extrapolated out. I mean, you can see from a magnitude standpoint, with the advent now of ransomware and, and other sorts of phishing attacks, you're really seeing the numbers start to climb because it's not only the cost now of a potential ransomware and needing to pay that ransom, and we'll discuss that in a little bit. Um, but also really the, the remediation of the risk, the damage that, be, that, that can be had from these sort of attacks, right? It's not just a loss of data. Sometimes they can shut down entire ecosystems. It's the business interruption. It's the additional expenses attached to that. So just some things to consider. 
when we look at small to medium businesses and we look at cyber risk strategy, we, we focus on three areas and on the people, the process and the technology. And at Broad Street Labs, we kind of go in with uh, the motto of a proactive mindset towards cyber resilience. And cyber resilience is really a full program. It's not just a one off. It's not just ensuring that you have one piece. It really is that three prong approach at looking at what your people know and understand what kind of processes do you have in place and do you have the right technology in place to support those processes so first and foremost with people security awareness training is is paramount it really is the, the foundation aside from getting the basic protective measures in place if you're not aware of what can hurt you and how it can hurt you because what happens is you have a lot of companies that put all of these protocols in place. They don't adequately train their employees. And if you look back, you know, earlier in, in the slide previous, those phishing and social engineering attack at 53%, that's directly attributable to people, right? So at the end of the day, it does fall back to your weakest link is usually your people, many times by no fault of their own. If they have the proper training, it gives them something to look out for. They start to understand what could seem right, what doesn't pass a smell test, right? So understanding basic security principles, um, basic phishing attacks, malware attacks, what do they look like, right? Going through a condensed train, a cadence, I'm sorry, training and simulation. So yes, you can do an initial training and part of that training are normal, normal simulations that you go through, which are very effective. And they test out different attacks with employees to ensure they understand uh, you know, exactly what they were just taught and use that as a learning mechanism. People are going to make mistakes in that process. That's expected. You want that. So then you can use that as a learning opportunity. But the important word there is, is cadence. The idea that it's not just a one-off. You need to revisit your training programs. You need to do this, whether it's quarterly, at least biannually. And the reason being is that it's nearly impossible at this point, and that's a collective opinion, you cannot stay ahead of cyber criminals. The amount of technology and the ease by which they can deploy many of these attacks, which does not require a technical expert any longer, um, leads it to a level of sophistication that is almost impossible to keep up with. So the need to go back to employees and constantly educate them on new sorts of attacks and what we're seeing so that they can be familiar with exactly what's out there. Having a fractional CISO or CIO, you've all probably heard of, and if you have in a virtual CISO, uh, Chief Information Security Officer, uh, also, uh, officer excuse me, or a Chief Information Officer, at least having someone that can come in there and help you define what a security program should look like. It doesn't mean that you have to install one right off the bat, but you should really understand the basic principles and tenets and where the gaps are and what it would need to get you there. They'll help you get structure and help build that foundation uh, with the process and the technology as well as the people. So it's important to get some engagement with someone at that level. And if you can't afford to have someone on staff, at least think of uh, a fractional virtual CISO. This is a perfect time to engage these sort of resources with the current employment landscape that we're at right now. So there's already been a big push for virtual CISOs. There's a high turnover rate with large enterprises. Uh, unfortunately, it's a, it's a very difficult sort of job. It's uh, a C-suite job that often doesn't get uh, the influence and the seat at the actual C-suite table, but the expectations are still just as high. So because of that, you'll see some turnover. It doesn't mean there's a lack of capability. There's a lot of really bright folks out there that really know what they're doing and can really help out small businesses. So don't be afraid to engage uh, virtual CISOs or CIOs. Um, the second piece here, looking at process. Hey Adam? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, do, do you have a virtual um, CIO that, that you could recommend or, or places to look? Absolutely. Yeah, as, as part of Broad Street Labs, right, as part of our solution planning, we bring in virtual okay. CISOs from various elements. Oh, a absolutely. Okay, good to know. Thank yeah. you. Um, and, and by the way, Jamie, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. It, I mean, it's because it sounds intimidating for a really small office. It's like, woo, you know? And, and, <laughs> absolutely. Well, and that's why bringing in someone like a fractional CISO can totally. really, it can help you out, right? Totally. Because they're going to, it's easy for me to, to provide a presentation here with all these different elements and a wealth of information. Yeah, of course. They'll break it down and simplify it. And they'll build out a roadmap. And right. 
that's the important thing. We'll talk a little bit more about our roadmap, but yeah, they'll spell that out for you. And then it allows you to kind of work in, in bits and pieces. So, and, and Jamie, and also if there are other questions while I'm going through this, please just, just cut me off. Um, oh, if, if anyone has anything. Um, okay. Oh, the and second to, to the attendees, um, yeah. you, you are muted since we are a small group. I would say if you do have a question, you can just go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, normally I would say use the chat box, but we're a small group. So I think that's fine. Just remember to yeah. re-mute afterwards. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the, the second part here is about process. That virtual CISO will lay out what a, a security program should look like. So included with that would be basic use policies. They'll go over um, access control and they'll help you build out a playbook. And the second part of the playbook I want to focus on, which is operational readiness testing. I don't think this gets enough lip service. It's one thing to come up with a, all of your regulatory items, are you compliant with those, creating use policies for your employees, making sure that they have access only to the information that they need to have access to. These are all critical. That virtual CISO will be able to help out with that. The operational readiness testing, and forgive me, I steal this, I'm a former Air Force guy, so we used to do operational readiness inspections, and it was the biggest part of what we did because it puts into practice what you have in your playbook. So again, and you're seeing this now in many ways, even with companies with business continuity playbooks and everything else, if you're not testing these plans in some sort of cadence as well, you really don't know how effective they could be when you need it. And so the idea of building out a security program playbook that has normal business as usual, but also contingency planning. What does business continuity look like in worst case scenarios? We're seeing this play out right now in the biggest way with COVID-19, where even some of the most established companies are really, really struggling with this for two reasons. A, because a lot of them haven't tested it, as I mentioned, and B, are they real world? Have they considered all scenarios? This is so far out in left field with COVID-19 that it was inconceivable. In the same way, something that happened with 9-11 at the time was inconceivable, right? And it's the idea of being proactive in your mindset to start thinking so far out of the box about what would happen in absolute worst case scenarios to keep your business up and running? So operational readiness testing really provides that, that mechanism to be able to ensure that your playbook is, is current, it's relevant, and that it's effective. And it's something that, it's a, it's, a, it's a work in progress. This is a working, breathing, living document, and it should continue to evolve as new things come up, whether in your business, in the cybersecurity landscape, or whether it's you know, current events that are happening around us. So, that part is key. And then of course you have the technology piece, um, smart technology solutions, really that fit your company, your budget, and the means. There are a million different technology solutions out there. The cyber market is completely saturated um, with solutions in virtually every variety. There are segmentations uh, I mean, I, I'm looking at a, a I'm looking at a, a landscape document right now that has what well, it's got about 15 different segmentations just in the cyberspace, and there's probably a couple hundred companies here. So it won't be short of me of, of finding solutions. Having the right person to help you make those decisions is key. At Broad Street Labs, obviously, that's something that we do as well. Um, but from a basic perspective, you want to make sure you have endpoint protection. What's endpoint protection? That's inclusive of your antivirus, uh, malware protection. Those are the things actually on your devices, right? Your laptops, your mobile devices, any of your endpoints. Ensure you have basic firewalls in place, right? And these are up and running. And again, we'll still go through this later, but this is just kind of some best practices from a risk strategy perspective. Ensure you have firewalls and ensure you have data backup and recovery, right? And that you're testing these. Again, that falls in line with operational readiness even though you have a data backup, you have to ensure that you can actually restore that backup. I've seen way too many times in my career that folks do have a backup. They need to actually leverage it. Once they execute on it, they find out the backup was corrupted and now they don't have anything. So we'll talk more about it. Make sure that you have backup, make sure it's clean and make sure it's in multiple varieties. One of the other areas that, that we I'm not hearing you right now. I 
Adam, we can't hear you. Can you all hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Adam's connection might be lost, I'm thinking. Let's give him a minute to rejoin. Looks like he's rejoining. Connection problems, Adam? I see your screen, I'm still not hearing you. All right, how about now? Yep, now we can hear you again. Okay. And there's, also, there's also a question if they can have access to the slide deck. Oh yeah, sure, I'll distribute this afterwards. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, especially because at the end, there's also some resources and everything we'll talk oh, about as well. Ahead. Yeah, okay. so. Yeah, I'll send this out. Um, okay, so um, cyber insurance. I think what I was saying is that this is a critical foundational piece with cyber resilience. Why? Here you're talking about business continuity, right? This is not the savior for your business. It's not meant to be. What cyber insurance is and isn't is a huge education piece. Uh, one of the reasons why I decided to get involved, go get my license, because I'm coming from the cyber risk side, but there is such an opportunity with cyber insurance because it can be so beneficial and it's completely being missold right now. And the reason why I say that is because most of those selling cyber insurance are not cyber risk or cyber security professionals. They're insurance brokers, right? There's no separate certification or license needed to sell cyber, right? So if you don't have an understanding of cyber insurance, you're really just selling pieces of paper. There needs to be an education of what's really covered and what's not covered. There needs to be an open dialogue and discussion about what your business is, beyond just revenue and you know what type of data you have, but really what type of coverage do you do you absolutely need? What is mission critical for you, right? And then if something happened, what would you need to stay afloat? So cyber insurance is really a one-two punch. It's this plus the risk strategy, those risk advisory services kind of that we talked about before, at least building those in. They have to come together, right? So it's not just Cyber insurance will be cyber insurance plus the security programs and everything you have. With the reason being that if you actually have a claim and the insurance companies discover there was a liability that was not plugged, right? Or that you're not doing your due diligence with your own cybersecurity program or making an effort, there's a chance that they will not honor that claim and pay out, right? So these are things that aren't really discussed. So they really have to come together. Um, so if cyber insurance exists in two realms. There's third-party liability coverage, which is if you're held responsible for someone else's data or someone else's business. And then there's first-party liability coverage, which obviously is your business. So I'm not gonna go through these uh, in an exhaustive nature, but it just gives you an idea of what type of coverage is available with both. These are things that we offer with Broad Street Labs. And really what it's designed around is the ability to absorb a cyber event and still keep your business afloat, right? So less about the computer replacement sort of things, more about fund transfer fraud. If there was wire fraud that happens, digital asset restoration, if, if there's a data breach, business interruption, extra expense. We hit on that a little bit earlier. Right, so this is your basic business expenses. So if your business is down for X amount of time, the coverage should be there to help you stay afloat with whatever those interruption expenses are. Cyber extortion, that's ransomware. Um, this, I want to address this now because this is an interesting topic with ransomware. Um, on the one hand, there's the idea of not um, paying out ransomware. So if the idea around ransomware is that uh, a cyber criminal gets access to your data, they encrypt your data and they hold that data ransom and will only give you the de-encryption the key uh, for a fee, right? insurance standpoint, the insurers, um, oh, I hope I don't lose everyone again. Can, can everyone still hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, so yeah, so from an insurer standpoint, it's interesting because there's usually a, uh, 
a deductible in your policy that can be 1,000, 5,000, or up to 10,000 if you have a $5 million policy. And these go in million, million dollar policy increments, usually starting at a million. And I will say in general, there is a high supply, high demand economic condition right now with cyber insurance, so policy rates are very low. So it's not a matter of affordability. Cyber insurance policies are very affordable. It's really understanding what you're getting or what you're not getting because that's part of the problem right now. Everyone's grabbing the cyber insurance and thinking I'm covered. Um, with ransomware, it's an interesting dynamic because it would, a lot of times these uh, ransomware fees could be anywhere from you know $50,000 up. And so clearly nobody wants to pay the $50,000. Yes, the insurers would cover the cost of that, but they'd quicker just say, take the claim and pay the $10,000 deductible which is much better than $50,000 and it's cheaper for them, right? So it's a very interesting dynamic that's happening around ransomware. It's a much bigger discussion. It's not a one size fits all. I think it's very, um, very specific to whatever case is happening. Now, of course, if you go through with some of the things we're talking about here and you have backup and recovery and disaster recovery and these things in place, ransomware becomes a moot point right? Because then you can let them have your data. You have copies of your data. They can't really hurt you. So there are strategies you can have in place for that. Um, breach response is another big one here. If you do have uh, any sort of attack or any sort of breach, the risk mitigation and the cost to get your systems back online is also covered by insurance as well as crisis management and PR, uh, reputation repair, all really big stuff. With the regulatory environment now requiring that you respond in X number of days with any sort of public breach in which you could be held liable in that regard as well. It's important to get word out to your customers when something happens. They help offset the cost of that and any reputation repair from a branding perspective that would need to be done, right? So they help offset that cost as well. So these are areas that cyber insurance is an important foundation. It can't just stand alone, and it's not meant to replace a security program. And I think that's really important to understand. So let me pause there for a sec. Was there a question, Jamie? Did someone pop up with one? Let me see. Yes, I can hear you're going to be sending out the deck. So you can provide, yes, I can provide the liability insurance as well. Yep, yeah. you got it. Yep. Yeah, so we're, we are a brokerage. So yes, we can provide the policies. We partner with the company that does the underwriting and binding. Um, I will say this, I am not a fan, we are not a fan of just selling coverage standalone. If there is a need and that's all you want, we can certainly comment at that need. We're not gonna turn away that business. We would still provide the free education, everything that comes with it. But we would rather have a discussion around your business to understand, A, what type of cyber insurance you should be buying. You shouldn't be paying more than you need to. There are certain things you may need that you may not need, right? So you wanna have that discussion. Um, and on top of that, you wanna make sure, like I said, that you have the right levers in place that should a claim arise that you can actually get paid out on that claim. Make sense? All right. So let's start talking about COVID-19. Um, hold on, looks like there's a question. Thank I think you. you answered it. Yeah. You're welcome. Um, so COVID-19 has presented itself as a massive opportunity for cyber criminals. Um, aside from the toilet paper on the right, I felt remiss I had to add toilet paper. It's a weird dynamic of COVID-19. Um, but yeah, we're working from home. We're scrum scrounging for toilet paper and we're social distancing ourselves. But from a cyber perspective, this is an absolute Super Bowl sort of event for them. And you would think that there would be some consciousness there because it is global in nature and that there's a major healthcare pandemic that is catastrophic, but they don't look at it this way. It's still information. And I mean, it's still opportunity. And why? Because people are craving information, right? They're playing off the global fear and uncertainty of the pandemic and the insatiable thirst that people have to grab information from wherever they can, right? So they are really going full tilt. I'm sure people have heard they've attacked um, hospitals, testing labs, research facilities, healthcare providers, urban care centers, 
they don't discriminate. They've gone after the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. They've gone after one of the largest labs in Czechoslovakia that was doing all of the coronavirus testing. They were one of two for the entire country. They don't really care. Um, this, again, is an, is an opportunity. And, and why? Because, again, people are scared. And when people get scared, they make irrational decisions. They aren't thinking very clearly about cyber. So the idea of now pulling everyone from their work environment and putting them at home opens up a whole world of additional opportunities, right? So the type of scams that you're seeing, those are the ransomware sort of attacks. On the left are some of the phishing scams. And these are some things to, this is real world stuff to look out for. Um, informational clinical trials. So they are posing, and for those of you that aren't familiar with phishing scams, these are techniques that they'll use normally via email to be able to solicit personal information from you. So um, they could say, phishing could be malware. So it could having, have you click on something that could execute some sort of malicious program within your computer that can either crash your computer or be designed to steal data. They could try and get you to provide personal information, right? And again, playing off those fears. So trying to find information on clinical trials, they'll try and get personal data that way. Protective equipment, masks, gloves, things like that. Adam, we may have we may have lost your uh, speaker again. Yeah, Adam, I think we lost your sound connection. Your screen is back up. These are the trials and tribulations of when you work from home. And <laughs> issues. All right, this we is, got you again. <laughs> it's real world stuff. Okay, so what was the last thing everyone heard? I think examples of types of uh, phishing emails talking yeah. about the crucial equipment that people are needing right now. Okay, got it, yeah. So after that, I was talking about the pandemic updates. Um, Johns Hopkins has come out as one of the authoritative sources of information regarding the global numbers. We've seen a lot of impersonators um, acting as Johns Hopkins and asking you to click on interactive maps and links and things like that. Don't do that. We'll go over some of those in the best practice. That's a huge phishing scam going on right now. Um, stimulus drives with the $2 trillion stimulus bill. Um, there's all sorts of emails floating out there. Um, grants for work-related money, calls for donations. You know, they're, they're playing off the sympathetic tone that people have right now to want to help and be eager to help. So, yeah, Adam, so if, if I can add, um, yeah. we've heard that there are um, that there are some phishing attempts or or not necessarily, not even necessarily phishing, but also scams involving the different federal relief programs. Okay. So we've advised that uh, even though it may say it's from the SBA and there's a logo, just be really cautious. No one should yep. be asking you for identifying information via an email. Um, you, you should never have to pay for these Absolutely. applications. Yep. So those are little um, things to look out for. And I've gotten, some, I've gotten some phishing that's been trapped luckily by my spam filter of just kind of looking like it comes from a known um, contact and just saying so and so has sent you an important document and it looks like it's from Dropbox but luckily yep. my spam had already filtered that out but I am getting some. Yeah well and, and that's such a big point Jamie because and I, I alluded to this earlier the sophistication that the cyber criminals have now is amazing and their ability to yeah. it, it, they were so easy to detect in years past and nowadays, you really have to be careful because it's so easy to just see it and make it and, and click, right? Um, very quick anecdote. Uh, my my mother-in-law, this just happened like two weeks ago. She upgraded her iPhone and she calls me at like 11 o'clock at night. And, um, and she says, I have a question for you. Right after I finished my update, I got an email from Apple support saying I needed to click on this to finish completing the upgrade. 
And wow. she goes, and she goes, I thought it was weird because I started asking for information. And then they wanted my social security number. And she goes, obviously I didn't provide it, but I said, you know, obviously forward it over to me. And what struck me was the sophistication, not only of how the email looked, but think of the timing of that. She just completed the upgrade, right? So it's, it's beyond just how things look. It's the timeliness of when things are happening. Clearly, there are other levers in play here for them to be able to access certain information. I, I sent this to Apple because obviously they need to look into that because whether it was information from her phone or information in flight from Apple somehow that they knew she just completed an upgrade. So it just lends itself to how careful we need to be and you know, really what, what we need to look out for. Um, and also for every business owner that's on the line who has staff to make sure that they are providing this information to, to all of the people who are on their staff. Yep. Like, all it takes is one, one person to make a mistake. Exactly. And, and that's why I said with security training, it's so important to have a cadence, right? It's not just a one-off. You, you need to constantly be yeah. giving your employees information about the latest. And we'll, we'll talk more about that, but absolutely. That, that's in my next slide. So what does the impact look like here? What's the security impact? So I, I took this as telework risk exposure, right? I have this as number two, but first of all, and you even see it now. What just happened with me three times getting kicked off my Wi-Fi? It, it's more people are on Wi-Fi around here. I mean, more people are, are sucking up infrastructure, right? There's more bandwidth. There's more traffic being consumed, which is impacting networks, right? Um, so there's going to be additional strain on infrastructure. When that happens, that opens up opportunity, right? There's more opportunity. There's more endpoints. People, there are new policies in place right now that people aren't used to. So there are new corporate policies and procedures. This is still new to most companies. There are many companies that don't really have room, uh, a full work from home or remote work policy. So things are being done on the fly. And with that in place, so now you've kind of unleashed an entire workforce where there's a lot of ambiguity in terms of what the rules are, what they can and can't do, right? So you've got the use of non-work devices on public channels, that in and of itself. In a way, it's a little bit of a blessing from a security standpoint that we are home instead of being able to go and still go to Starbucks and work from public Wi-Fi hotspots, that would expose it even worse, right? Because people will be doing all of their confidential work in those places. So at least we can isolate it to the home and do something a little uh, more constructive with that. Um, increased number of threat factors, just more endpoints. I mean, now you've got more devices coming online at home. Uh, you've got work laptops, you've got personal laptops, you've got work phones, you've got personal phones. So with all of these, these are just more avenues for cyber criminals to attack. People are distracted. Let's face it. I mean, this is actually amazing. It's the first call I haven't had my dog barking. And luckily my kids are out of the house right now at their grandmother's down the street um, uh, because the distractions are everywhere, right? And it's, it's a new form of distraction. We all have work distractions, but now a home life distraction is very different. We're all in the same place. Husbands and wives are working full time. Kids are being homeschooled, right? So you're being pulled in a lot of different directions, which means your focus a lot of times is not on the security aspect of what you're doing, right? Am I doing work stuff on the right computer? Should I not be doing that? Did I just take a, a thumb drive and plug it into my personal laptop, right? And then of course, we'll get into all the things regarding how to actually harden your own infrastructure. Uh, but there's general distractions and this just creates opportunities. Um, and really it, overall, it's just a larger wealth of opportunity for them to compromise networks to gain access to your data, right? So with all those increased threat factors, lack of attention, everything else, it's just a chance for them to catch you with your guard down, right? And you couple that with the fact that there aren't strict corporate policies. There are people that, and I think we take this for granted. I was just talking about this this morning. I've been working from home for a while. Um, I've been doing remote work for several years. So obviously it's not an adjustment for me. The adjustment is having the rest of my family here as well um, throughout the day and juggling those priorities. But there's a lot of people that have never worked from home before. And there's a significant adjustment that needs to happen. I know many people that really couldn't work from home because they just said, I, I can't do it. I need to be around people. There's too many distractions in general, right? So these are all things to keep in mind and cyber criminals view these all as, as weaknesses, right? And opportunities. Make sense? Yep. 
All right. So let's go over some things that we can do. So these are some corporate responsibilities. So for the business owners that might be on the call or for those that want to understand from a business perspective, what should you be doing? Update your training material. We've, we've talked about having security awareness training, having a playbook, having all these things. This is the time that if you don't have one, develop one. If you do have one, make sure you update it. Take advantage of the appetite for news and, and the consumption of new information right now. Employees want that. This will help them feel safe with what they're doing. I think the more um, information they have, the better off that they are. So use this as an opportunity to engage them around security and have those discussions. Um, you know, provide the latest for cyber attacks. What's going on in the world? Some of the things we're talking about here, all of this is publicly available, right? There's nothing that I put in this presentation whatsoever that you can't Google and find yourself. So all the information is out there. And I provide some resources, by the way, in the end, where you can go to find additional information and also to report things that happen. Um, so that can at least set you off on the right foot. But make sure you're updating your material, you're engaged with your, your employees about what's happening out in the cyber world because it's critical at this point. And what it does, it keeps it top of mind for them, right? So that's first. Number two, review your security policies. What are your bring your own device policies? Most companies have these right now. Small companies might not. This goes to the idea of really creating that separation between work and personal. Make sure your employees understand the difference between the two, right? Whether or not it's acceptable to do any work. If you are a completely cloud-based company, fine. Maybe you can use your personal computer for that. That's fine. There's a lot of companies and in regulated industries where that sort of remote work, you have to connect through a VPN. It should only be done on a work computer. You shouldn't be doing things on a personal computer, things like that. So review your bring your own device policies, review your acceptable use policies. What are acceptable devices to be used for what type of work material, right? What type of activities? Make sure they understand that. Password policies. Can't stress this enough. We'll talk about this on the next slide as well, but really reinforce password policies, not only with your individual employees, but as a company, review your password policies when they expire. Maybe you start to tighten that. Maybe you have to change your password every week instead of every month or every 90 days, just to ensure that you're keeping your network and your access to data safe, right? So review those policies, see if they need to be updated, review them with your employees, right? Security measures for personal devices, again, this goes into kind of that acceptable use policy, but making sure that for those personal devices, talk to your employees about what updates need to be made, right? Make sure apps are updated, make sure operating systems are updated, right? Make sure your own operating system has the latest iOS or Microsoft, you know, the Windows updates. Critical, right? Because that's how with a lot of these ransomware attacks or, you know, not Petya, WannaCry, these were all exploits in just un unpatched Microsoft operating systems. Very simple stuff, right? But it's stuff you don't think about on a daily basis. This is a good time to rethink that, right? So make sure you talk to your employees about that. VPN. Goes without saying, if you have the opportunity to use VPN, if you're connecting to remote networks, do it. This is an added layer of protection. It's a security tunnel that ensures end-to-end -end encryption of data. You really can't hack it. There are ways that it can be exploited. It's not so easy, right? So it's just another layer uh, of deterrence. It really needs to be in place. Uh, the third one here, breach response plan. So this goes back to that playbook, that business continuity, right? What is your response? If something does happen, right? Do you have an idea of what you would do, who you would contact, right? Review the federal and state regulations and guidelines. Understand what your responsibilities are, right? As a business, right? Who you have to report to, how long, what those periods are. Are there probation periods? Are there penalties? Things like that. So review the federal and state guidelines. Look at your disaster recovery plan. Again, make sure that not only you have a plan in place, but that you're testing. Understand where all of your data resides, where you would be recovering from. Make sure you have it in multiple places, right? Don't just have one backup of something. If that backup is corrupted, you're still dead in the water. So make sure you have multiple backups and make sure you're testing regularly. And that's why I said scenario plan and walkthrough. Step through these things. Talk about, and, and I hope this is one of the, there, there are some, Great opportunities coming out of COVID. If you take the healthcare pandemic piece out of it, 
And it's easier to say because I haven't been ter- personally touched by it. And I hope nobody on the call has. But if you remove it, there are great opportunities for business innovation here, right? This is one of them. Constantly be thinking about whether it's quarterly scenario plan. What do we do if, if this happens? What if we can't access our information? What if we can't access our computers, right? For people that need to be on site, what if they can't be on site? These sort of things. So think about the, the different scenario plans and then do a walkthrough. Step through what would actually happen. It's literally a fire drill. This is no different than what we did as kids. It's no different than what my kids do in school. Go through a fire drill. It doesn't have to be something you know grandiose, but it's a general understanding of what worked and what didn't work, right? Any questions? Okay. I'm not seeing any. Okay. So now these are kind of the personal responsibilities about telework. Talked about passwords before. Now it's time to really get into passwords from a personal level. A lot of people hate this idea of password managers. Password managers are awesome. And why are they awesome? Because you don't have to remember passwords. You have to remember one password. Yes, the idea comes up that if that one password is breached and they have access to all of your passwords, that's all very true. But it's the same if you only have one or two passwords you have for everything else, there's a much greater chance they can get that one and get everything else. So password managers are an excellent way to make sure you have strong passwords for all of your different sites and devices, right? I have over 200 passwords of which I know one. That's it, right? So use password managers. Multi, uh, MFA is uh, multi-factor authentication, true factor authentication. Wherever this is available, use it. Um, in most uh, Microsoft Office products now they have it. Google has it. Banks have it now. If they offer it, use it. This is how you get past cyber attacks from people attacking your personal information, right? It ensures that the only person getting access to that information is you because you have to put in a second step authentication, right? And that'll be what you know is a code on your phone. It could be an email, it, you know, a text. It could be a phone call, whatever that is. Same concept of when you have an alarm. Someone have a question? Let's see. Can you recommend a password manager? I use LastPass. I've been using LastPass for, for years. Um, Dashlane is another one. Uh, I can send you a link. There, there's a whole bunch of them you, you can pick from. I'm a fan of LastPass. Um, they've been around for a long time and I like that. Um, you, you just, you want a company that's, I think anyway, that's been around for a little while that it has a trustworthiness. Um, so yeah, LastPass is who, what, what I would recommend, but there are plenty of others out there with different price points. All right. Um, your Wi-Fi password in your home. Make sure that you change it every once in a while and make sure that it's a strong password. My wife, this drives my wife crazy because I have strong passwords all over the place. And then when she has to put it in, she's like, are you serious? So um, it could be completely annoying. And that's, <laughs> and I told her, I'm like, this is kind of the, the price you have to pay, you know, to, to live in a secure world. I mean, yeah, fortunately you have to look up passwords sometimes. Um, so it could be burdensome. Change your Wi-Fi passwords. Change them up every once in a while. Make sure they're a strong password. Strong passwords are typically at least 12 characters. They have a mix of uppercase and lowercase and special characters and numbers, right? So, and we, with these password managers, um, what's I think your your volume's out again. Can you hear me now? I just heard you. Yep. Now we're good. Okay. Yeah, I was just. Mm, out again. In and out right now. Let me. Uh, I wonder. Well, I think it'll be the same because it's my internet connection. I was going to say I can try and use my phone to dial in. Yeah, you know what? Let me try and do that. Yeah, hang that on. could work. That could work. Yeah, yeah, hang on. Let me put a headset on. I don't want the feedback to come in. Just give me one sec.
Okay, can everyone hear me? There's feedback. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, let's see how this goes. I think that's better. Okay, we'll plow through. We're almost at the end here. So actually, we've got one more, one more slide after this. Okay, um, so I think I was talking about Wi-Fi passwords. Make sure you change those. Router passwords, this is a big one, especially because most people don't do this. Routers come with default passwords. You can go online, people can look up what model you have and be able to get your default password, right? So if you don't change that, if they access your router, they take over everything. They can lock you out of your own network. All right. So find out what model you have, even if it's through Comcast or your internet service provider, the, the default password is in there. So find out who you have, go in there and change that router password. So that those are quick password tips. Let's see, is there another question? Uh, someone was just asking for the link to last pass. So I posted the link. Oh, thanks, Jamie. Appreciate it. Um, email scrutiny. So this goes back to what we were talking about earlier, especially now, unless you are really confident with the source that you have, don't click or download attachments, right? I would simply say that, um, yes, verify the source of everything, examine senders addresses. This is how you do it. So if something seems suspicious to you at all, all you have to do is hover over the email address of the sender, unless it says at and the company or in some form of that where you expect it to be coming from, most likely with phishing scams, you'll see a whole bunch of gobbledygook, a whole bunch of nonsensical mix of, of letters and numbers and everything else. That's when you know it's not a legitimate source. So if at all you see something, and Jamie mentioned this before, nobody should be requesting, no company should be requesting any information over an email, right? If they ask you to provide any information or click here to provide personal information, that's a surefire way that it's a scam, right? There might be follow-ups and it might say, click this link to do this, verify the sender, make sure you were expecting some sort of email like that. So it's a matter of just some awareness, some due diligence. Don't just be clicking around on everything because that's when mistakes are made. And they, they pray off that because they know that's the distracted mindset that we have right now. And whatever you do, if you do click on something and it seems suspicious, never provide personal information, right, for anything. If it does seem off, call the company and, and say, hey, this personal information was, requ was requested. Did that come from you? Something along those lines. But the big thing is to always examine the entire email, examine that sender address. Those are surefire. That Apple support uh, email that I mentioned from my mother-in-law. Yeah, if you, I said to her, I, I said, now look, and I taught her. I said, hover over the email address. And sure enough, it didn't come from Apple, you know, support.apple.com or any variety of that. It was a whole bunch of nonsensical letters. Um, so that's email. Data segregation. This is an important one. Separate your work and home device use. So if you have a work device at home, just do your work on your work device. Don't move between the two, even if it's convenient. So this way, you don't have to worry about it. The data is isolated to one device. It's not moving between different devices and different security levels because the security that you have on your laptop is governed by corporate policy, which will not be the same as what you have on your personal laptop. So make sure that you keep them separate. Keep family members off your work devices. This, this is, you know, a fairly common sense one, but also it's, it's a little bit more difficult now that we're home with, with families and many times kids and husbands and wives. Make sure that you keep your work devices only to your work and keep everyone else off that. And this way you don't have to worry about it. Um, security tools. So these are some of the tips and this is for your personal stuff. Endpoint protection. So make sure you have at a minimum antivirus, make sure it's update. I would go, I would probably extend it further and get one that is endpoint protection, which also has anti-malware. Excuse me, the difference between the two being that antivirus looks more at traditional Trojans and worms things that are kind of out there on the internet already that have been around for a while. So they have um, digital fingerprints of certain things to look for. Malware is much more proactive, which is updated more regularly, which is a database of all these different forms of various attacks. 
So it's important to have both of those. Um, I mentioned this earlier, make sure that you're patching um, your operating system, you're updating your, whether it's Microsoft or iOS, get the latest updates in there when they come out. Software updates, firmware updates, anything on your router, anything on your apps, anything that needs to be updated. Um, there's always a concern about testing and whether or not they are valid. There's a question here. Uh, we're starting to record video messages to send to our clients. Should we do anything special to make sure the message is safely delivered and people will not be afraid to open it? Certainly send a notification first that you will be engaging in this sort of policy. Tell them to look out because depending on what type of firewalls you have and spam filters, things like that may wind up in a junk folder. So let them know that A, it's coming across, and then if they don't receive it, please check your spam or your junk email folder. You may have to, and I wouldn't suggest at this point that you tinker too much with those filters, which you can do it at a later date. Um, I would keep everything fine for now. If you do plan on changing that spam filter, just make sure you do some testing around it. But yeah, send out a notification. It's fine to send the videos. If they know it's coming from that sender, let them know who it will be coming from. And this way there's an expectation set there. And then of course, let them know where it could arrive. All right. Um, data backup. We hit on this a couple times. Cloud, external drive, password protect these things, make sure you're using encrypted sources. So I, I encrypt in two different cloud sources and an external drive with all of my data. I don't store anything. Now granted, my personal, my work laptop are the same, right? I'm my own business, I use one in the same. Um, but all of my stuff is stored separately within that. I segregate the drives within that and I segregate the storage for these. So, but I keep them in three locations, one physical, two cloud-based. So that if God forbid something happens, there is any sort of attack, I know exactly where my data is, the status of that data. And yes, and I do check periodically at least once a week to make sure that those backups are good. So it's a lot different than the days of take backups where you have to do a formal restore and everything else. You know this, it's just file movement, right? So you're gonna see in the same file structure, make sure that you click on some of these files. They're still active, they're being updated, things like that. Using things like iCloud, I store everything directly there. Um, so it's, I can access it on my phone, I can access it on my laptop, um, and then I do another backup off that. Um, there's plenty of good cloud-based um, data storage. Most of them have pretty good encryption at this point. There are some pretty strong encrypted uh, storage sites out there like pCloud, and things like that. I could provide a list if you want to go with even stronger enforcement of that. They all ensure that there is end-to-end -end encryption of data as it's being loaded to the cloud. And it's also so it's stored. Uh, data at rest is encrypted. Data in transmission is encrypted. Um, so they, uh, you don't have to make sure there's any prying guys getting into that data. But just make sure you have the backups in place um, and make sure you test them out. Collaboration tools. So this is kind of a big one to finish up on because I'm sure you've heard a lot of, one of the biggest things right now are Zoom exploits. Hang on, looks like there's a question coming in. Yes, I'd like a list, sure, I can send that out to you. Um, so one of the biggest things right now is, is Zoom. Zoom shot up, this is a crazy stat. So in December, they had 10 million active users. Today, they have 200 million. So kudos to Zoom, good for their business. It also means that there's a huge security hole that's just waiting to happen. So, and, and I'm guilty of this myself. Zoom is very uh, easy to use. And what happens is you wind up just sending something out. And Jamie, we can implement this for further meetings. Make sure you use meeting passwords, right? Mm -hmm. um, because people are hijacking. They're able to get, whether it's through email or otherwise, they're able to get into uh, Zoom conferences and they're causing all sorts of problems. Right, so one of the things you can do is use meeting passwords. Um, don't publish invitations on any social media sites, uh, any publicly broadcasted uh, sites, things like that. That makes sense. Um, you can also use waiting rooms, which means the ability to let people in. Nobody can just join, even if they're invited. So for larger meetings, it's a bit cumbersome, um, but surely it, it means that nobody can just hijack the meeting and jump in. You'd have to let them in. Right. Um, 
disable recording is fine for things like this. We're doing great, but in general, disable other people's abilities to record, disable other people's abilities to screen share things like that and require a host presence. That's the last one. That's a setting, Jamie. I think we're right. You can't join unless the host is joined. Mm -hmm. So that's another one. So some of these are fairly common sense, but other ones, you know, I I've never use meeting passwords. I never use a waiting room. I'll use the host one. So these are things now that even myself, I need to implement these things. Um, Zoom has said that they do ensure end-to-end -end encryption, um, but they have recognized that they need to do more from a security standpoint. So these tips go beyond just Zoom. This is fairly generic with collaboration tools, but um, this is a new threat factor that's really being heavily exploited uh, by cyber criminals. So just something to, uh, to consider there. Before I move on to the last slide, any, uh, any questions? I'm not seeing any. Okay. So I promised you a couple resources. These are great resources that A, reinforce a lot of what I had in some of these slides. So they give a lot of best practices and things like that. So this, these are good, um, good tools to tap into. Also, if an event happens to you and you're unsure where to go, how to react, these are some resources. This is where you can go, where you can actually report things happen. And what they'll do is they'll get someone on the line with you to help point you in the right direction. Um, so if something does happen, you have general questions, you're not sure, you know you, there was a cyber event, it may or may not be hurting your business, you want to report it, these are all great resources. Um, and like I said, I'll send out the deck. And then of course, as well, I want to point out, if something happens, you can contact myself over at Broad Street Labs. We do breach remediation. Uh, we handle cyber insurance claims in case there is some sort of attack. We work with insurance companies from a liability perspective to ensure the payout. And keep in mind, and I deliberately did this, I want to work on behalf of the insured. That's why I'm a broker, right? So I don't work on behalf of any of the insurers. I work on behalf of my clients. So with that being said, thank you so much for your time, Jamie. I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to come on here and to speak to some of the folks in the small business community. Um, so yeah, let me know if there's any questions or anything. No, this was really great, Adam. Um, I really appreciate the presentation. So thank you for doing this right now. It's, it's very, very important things to cover. Are there any final questions before we let Adam go? Either by unmuting yourself or you can put it in the chat. Excellent. Yeah, I'm not seeing any. Thank you all for joining us. We'll um, send a follow up with the slides. I'm going to put some resources right here in the chat box before we finish. So there you'll see a link to um, the Temple SBDC's open office Zoom hours. So we have consultants uh, from three to five daily because we know how important your questions are right now. I also included a link to our resource page that we update every day. And then that last link is a survey from today's uh, webinar so we can get feedback from you. Okay. Excellent. Thank you all so much. I appreciate it. Hey, stay safe and stay healthy out there, everyone. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Adam. Thanks a lot.